welcome to this afternoon's panel on the state of the natural gas liquid supply uh, surplus and uh, the supply demand balance. Uh, my name is Larry Foster. I'm a uh, energy journalist of some 35 years, most of that time with Platts, where I was global editorial director for the natural gas, electricity, nuclear, coal, and renewable sectors. To uh, set the stage for our panel today, I thought maybe I'd uh, toss out a few headlines that I've heard through uh, discussions uh, uh, over the course of the day. As a, as a journalist, I tend to think in terms of headlines. So here's, here's a few that I came up with. Um, there's a structural change in the oil industry going on from a period of peak oil supply to peak oil demand. Uh, don't expect demand to fix the crude supply overhang. There's a possibility of a quote unquote air pocket for producers, uh, non-OPEC producers, uh, beginning in 2018, but that opportunity also could disappear pretty quickly uh, depending on events in the Middle East and elsewhere. The world is moving to a period of a big LNG surplus uh, with what Seth Kleiman called a wall of LNG headed to Asia. In fact, the Asian market share is, is really the only game in town for, uh, uh, for hydrocarbons. Um, and even at that, the rapid development of renewables uh, could turn uh, Asian demand into a black swan event. In the U.S., don't look to the power generation market as a source for considerable new demand. Uh, there's already a shift going on from hydrocarbons to renewables, that shift is real, and it's taking place faster than anyone probably expected. Uh, kind of further highlighting that is the clean power plan from the Obama administration just enacted, uh, which while it originally was seen as positive for uh, gas power demand, in fact, um, it could lead to almost zero new gas-fired uh, generation demand because of incentives built into the uh, regulation for renewables. In the U.S., CapEx ex expenses are dropping quickly. That's good news. Maybe the slightly less good news is that um, there will be a big uptick in volatility of both demand and, and thus prices. Uh, there's a few reasons for predictions of volatility. One is that coal's role as a safety valve in power generation is diminishing quickly. Uh, renewables generation is uh, ramping up quickly, and the profile of renewable uh, power production uh, is, is such that it requires a lot of flexibility uh, in, in other power supplies. And LNG swings in demand could be huge uh, what Andy Weissman referred to as the wild card of all wild cards. Um, there could be a, an overbuild of the gas infrastructure in the U.S. Uh, as soon as 2017, and don't bet the farm on $4 gas prices again anytime soon, and indeed perhaps in the foreseeable future. Um, maybe the most concrete piece of information that we heard today, uh, at least for your own personal investment portfolios, uh, was by 2018 or not much after, dump oil stocks and buy Tesla and solar. Um, so with that as a background, we'll turn to our panel to sift through what all this means for the uh, natural gas liquids market. Our first speaker will be Bob Simmons. Bob is manager of natural gas liquids at Genscape, uh, has been there for about three years, and prior to that, uh, worked in the uh, NGL industry for 15 years in trading and supply demand analytic positions. He'll be followed by Bill Briggs, director of waterborne uh, NGL origination for Phillips 66. Bill has been with um, uh, Phillips and ConocoPhillips for the last 11 years, holding positions in vessel chartering, management, and LPG origination. Prior to that, um, he was with some major companies, Coastal, El Paso, Clarkson's, in vessel chartering and brokering positions, 
and uh, interestingly started his career actually on boats, on uh, tow boats and, and oil tankers. And I'm guessing if you can corral Bill at the uh, cocktail reception, he may have a few stories to tell uh, from that chapter of his career. Um, finally, we have Mark Woods, president of Ethylene Strategies International. Mark has been involved in the industry for more than 30 years, beginning as a research chemist with Phillips uh, Petroleum, moving into a commercial role. And six, uh, since 2007, uh, he uh, has run Ethylene Strategies International, an independent consultant business, to help companies develop their business strategies uh, in the olefins market, which uh, given current market conditions we see today strikes me as a, uh, as a very challenging uh, position. So uh, Bob, you want to get us started, please? Thanks, Larry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess for most of you might have been here this morning and our grand will talk about uh, this natural gas forecast uh, here at Genscape. Um, I'm not going to kind of repeat what he said and talk a whole lot about what are the, a lot of the drivers behind what's economics and efficiencies and those types of things that's driving the production change that he talked about, but mainly how we utilize or what the end result is of his natural gas forecast being used in our models and what that means for natural gas liquids production in various shell plays. So um, with that, what we're going to do is kind of give a brief overview of um, natural gas process, natural gas production liquids from the tailgate of the gas processing plant uh, across the U.S. and Western Canada, and kind of where where we've been uh, in the last couple of years and where we see that going, um, and then a brief overview of a few of the key areas uh, that we uh, where we're expecting growth to continue, and some of the areas where we are seeing uh, some of the steepest declines or uh, to to show up and then kind of go through our view on how demand is changing for LPG over the next few years as well as ethane and kind of tie that back into um, what does that look like for um, a supply demand look uh, on year-on-year -year changes. So is, is production growth uh, expected to be demand? Is demand still lagging production growth? So if we look at our, our uh, current forecast for natural gas liquids, um, what you'll see here is that um, we had uh, very good growth uh, in 2014, and we followed that up with, with um, uh, a little less growth um, as we're seeing here in 2015. So in, in 14, we grew by a little over 400,000 barrels a day, and that's dropped down to 240,000 barrels a day in total in 2015. And going forward based off of current economics and our, our profile of natural gas um, and associated gas and how that is, is coming online, um, our, our production growth profile for 2016 and 17 is pretty much flattened out. Um, the biggest portion of that growth that we see in 16 and 17 and even in 18 is ethane recovery, um, effectively bringing on that additional supply that's being rejected today just to meet demand. Um, that's coming online for those sectors. Uh, so taking a look at the Marcellus and the Utica. So this is one of the areas where we continue to see uh, a uh, good growth occurring within the U.S. This is actually, when we look at our lower 48, this is the main region uh, where all of our growth is, is coming from for the most part. Um, and you can see when, when we look at that, the heart of this play, there's still 40% of the producers in that area still have good returns to continue to pr uh, produce in the area. So, but however, there are three things that are driving a lower growth rate that we've been seeing in the past, and even um, and one of those items uh, is, again, is the economics, uh, and then also the deferred well completions. Um, so what we can see here is there's about 250 wells that uh, drilled and uncompleted. Uh, that inventory has grown uh, through the course of 2015. So w with the economics of producers moving from 
the wet plays to the dry plays, and we've been seeing that happen with the decline in the rig counts with the deferred well inventory. All this is leading to profile that we see is that the processing plants, that inlet gas has plateaued and is actually flatlined. So we've got, uh, I think there was uh, some like 1.2 BCF a day of capacity that's recently came online that Mark West announced just recently over the last three months. And we're not seeing the type of growth in, into those plants as what they had anticipated. So we're seeing a slowdown in, in the inlet gas into a lot of these plants in the area. We're also seeing um, the impacts of the shut-in gas um, at various plants in that area as well. So that's all supporting um, our profile here that we are seeing a lot lower growth rate out of the Marcellus and Utica uh, is what we've seen historically. Uh, another part of the country where we see um, growth occurring is in the Permian. Uh, I think it goes back to some of the comments Randall was making earlier where you've got a lot of efficiency gains have been occurring in the Permian. So you still have producers putting a lot of their capital at work in this area. Uh, and that is leading to an uptick in natural gas. It's a large number relative to our production profile. So. There is some upside risk that we see in that just based on the amount of, of processing capacity that we have coming online, but we do believe that, that based off of the current returns uh, that the Ford curve is providing, that that processing capacity will be underutilized uh, in, in the near term. Taking a quick look at um, a couple of the other areas here. So most out, outside of the Marcellus and the Utica, all other shell plays that we look at uh, forecasting, uh, we're expecting to remain flat to decline over the next couple of years before starting to see an uptick again in 2018. So the region where we are seeing the biggest impact of the current price environment is South Texas. So right now, only about 20% of the, the, the play is economical at the current pricing level. And we've seen rigs drop by 64% in that area. And we are forecasting, as Randall showed earlier today, rigs to continue to decline in this area as well. So we do not see foresee substantially. We actually, this is the place where we see the most decline uh, starting. We actually believe that play has already plateaued from a natural gas liquid standpoint in the second half of 15 uh, and into 2016, we're going to start to see declines from natural gas liquids production. Um, the Bakken is another one of those areas where um, we're starting to see at least um, a plateau and, and flattening out. We don't see a lot of decline as we do in South Texas, but we are starting uh, to believe that there is some decline that's going to kick in there as well. Um, one of the um, upside risks to our forecast in the Bakken is all the gas that is currently being flared. Uh, so you, you, it's currently being flared because you've got constraints on the processing side. Um, so once that is alleviated with some of the projects that One Oak currently uh, has got in, in place to, uh, to alleviate some of that, they've got a new plant coming online. Uh, plus, they're doing a lot of compression work that will bring more gas into some existing plants. So once some of that comes online and you start to meet um, some of the, the regulations that the government, uh, that North, the state of North Dakota has put in place, although they have pushed those out further into 16 now, um, we do believe that there could be some risk uh, there that natural gas liquids does come on uh, a little quicker than what we're anticipating. Now taking a look um, at the other side of the equation, if we look at demand. So we've got LPG consumption capacity growing um, quite substantially over the next two years. And most all of that is solely related to LPG export facilities. Um, you've got uh, the Oxy terminal, uh, Enterprises terminal, and, and, and uh, Phillips 66's terminal all expected to come online uh, by the end of 16. And then you've got two PDH units coming online as well by the end of 16. Um, what's interesting, we do have an estimated start date of October for Oxy, and I would say I think we're pretty pretty good on that. Uh, as we have seen through our ship tracking, we've actually started to see vessels come into that terminal here 
recently. Um, so it looks like they're starting to, to have some activity around that. <coughs> so what does this growth in LPG consumption mean to a relative flat production forecast? So what you, what you can see here is that um, the capacity to consume uh, with the bars is the capacity to consume uh, LPG relative to the, the production growth, and these are year-on-year -year changes. So historically, year-on-year -year production has outpaced uh, LPG consumption growth. That's all getting ready to change in 2016 with, with the increase in, in export capacity and PDH. Uh, and we see um, that as, as you know, as, as key to these facilities being able to operate. We believe that um, a lot of these facilities will have to be underutilized um, going forward. You ex effectively probably send out your contractual tons, but anything above that um, is probably going to be hard to come by. Um, so we are seeing an overbuild of, of uh, capacity to consume relative to our production forecast uh, as we look at LPG going into 2016 and 2017. Uh, from an ethane perspective, um, as the charts earlier showed, um, a lot of our, our growth in production is not it's, it's, it's effectively just bringing the current supply that's available to the market. It's currently being rejected. Um, we've got our rejection numbers pegged around 650, 700,000 barrels a day. So it's currently being rejected into the gas stream. So you've got a lot of ethane that can come in to meet the demand of these crackers. So when you look at that, you've got, uh, you've got cracker capacity going from 1.3 million barrels a day today to over 1.7 million barrels a day in t by the end of 2018. You've also got another 250,000 barrels a day of waterborne export growth. Um, so when you look at that, you're going to need to recover a substantial amount of this ethane that's currently being rejected. Um, currently, um, when we look at that together with our, our supply forecast, you can see the green line there is how we bring on the ethane needed um, to meet all of this demand that's coming online. So if you look at the forward curve and you look at the frac spread, that frac spread does imply that when you get into late 16 and into 2017 that you should start to bring on some of this, but not all of it. So right now, your, your economics pretty much cover a take or pay contract or a variable cost to ship on a pipeline. So we do need more work to occur in the economics in, in order to bring on this 500,000 barrels a day of ethane supply that we're going to need in order to meet um, all the cracker demand and all of the waterborne export capacity that is likely to come online. And, and that does require those facilities at this level does require those facilities to run uh, at full rates as well. So in conclusion, um, in a current price environment, uh, this has led producer activity, uh, uh, re reduced producer activity, which is in turn dramatically impacting our growth rate that we have seen for natural gas liquids. Uh, from the tailgate of the processing plant. Um, we are slowing our growth rate down substantially in 2016 and 2017 before growing again in 2018. Uh, LPG consumption growth is set to outpace uh, our production growth on a year-on-year -year basis beginning in 2016 and beyond. Uh, and, and that's all based off of, like I said, current, current economics in the market for production. And we believe that's going to lead to an underutilization of that export capacity and or you're going to get a, a switch um, from away from ethane back to propane or away from propane back to ethane into the cracker. So effectively, you're going to have to minimize propane. Um, also, ethane rejection, uh, as I mentioned, we is currently at the high end of the range, if not maxed out across the majority of the US. Um, there is a couple of spots where we are seeing recovery happen that we, we can see where rejection could take place if it needed to. Uh, and we believe that is expected to remain at these levels through 2016. 
And then the projects to consume ethane, ethylene crackers, and the export will lead to lower ethane rejection beginning in 2017. Uh, in order to meet all of the uh, recovery that I feel that we're going to need, we will need a, uh, a frac spread response in the back of the curve once we get there and all these projects do come online. So that's all for now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bill Briggs uh, with Philip 66, uh, and I'm handling our long-term uh, contracts for our Freeport export facility. Uh, on the presentation today, I'm going to just give you a little rundown on Philip 66 initially, and then uh, talk about our project uh, in Freeport, and then uh, I'll go into just a little coverage of what's already really been covered on U.S. Uh, supply and then how uh, and where that supply might go in the world, so. <clears throat> uh, typical cautionary statement, please uh, don't make any investment decisions on anything I might say. Uh, my company might execute it before it, so. All right, uh, Philip 66, uh, you know, many of you are, you know, I'm sure are very familiar with ConocoPhillips. Uh, in 2012, uh, it was decided to split the company uh, as an integrated oil company into an upstream and downstream. So the upstream business stayed as ConocoPhillips and we became uh, Phillips 66 and we took the midstream and downstream uh, pieces of uh, that company. So, uh, we are, uh, we now market ourselves as a diversified energy manufacturing and logistics company. Uh, we have concentrations in midstream chemicals, refining and marketing and specialties. So this is our uh, current uh, asset footprint uh, here in the U.S. We have 90,000 barrels a day of refinery NGL production. We have 125,000 barrels a day of equity fractionator uh, capacity, 320,000 barrels a day of NGL and pipeline capacity, and uh, 4,330 miles of NGL and LPG pipelines. Uh, this is our uh, our new project. Uh, it's a you know s something uh, close to three and a half billion dollars worth of investment by Philip 66 to uh, build this total project. So within the project, we have a brand new 100,000 barrel a day fractionator, uh, which is being built down at our uh, Sweeney refinery. Uh, we have new salt dome storage that we're building in Clemens, and we have our export terminal in Freeport. Also, as part of that, we have a new pipeline that we've built from Mount Bellevue down to Sweeney. You know, it's a bi-directional uh, pipeline. So uh, that the fractionator, which is coming online as we speak, uh, can send product up to Bellevue until the uh, terminal is ready. The terminal will start up in uh, mid to late 2016. Uh, when that does start, we'll, and we uh, commence exports, we'll start bringing product down from Bellevue uh, to feed that export facility. The uh, salt dome storage facility, uh, initially building five to six million barrels of capacity there, uh, but we do have permitting to go all the way up to 32 million barrels. So we, you know, we have the capacity if uh, the market demands it, and we can expand. So, <clears throat> so the facility, uh, the export facility itself, is uh, as I said, located in Freeport, Texas. Uh, we think this terminal gives us certain geographic advantages over a lot of our competition. So uh, if you look at the Houston Ship Channel, you have a very highly congested channel, uh, very long transits in and out, and it's highly susceptible to delays during the winter in particular due to fog and, and uh, other items. So our facility uh, is away from all of that. We're only three miles from open water. Uh, the location of the uh, facility reduces the amount of uh, fog delays that we uh, incur as compared to uh, the Houston Ship Channel. We have a very deep uh, channel uh, going into the facility and a uh, uh, you know, sufficient width to bring in uh, the largest of the uh, gas ships. The uh, Freeport itself uh, moves about 35 million in annual cargo tonnage. There's very limited uh, capacity for them to grow beyond that. 
So the amount of congestion uh, should be limited in Freeport as compared to Houston where, you know, they just continue to build more terminals, open more export capacity, and uh, you get more and more ships coming in and out day on day. So uh, we have overbuilt the facility to uh, ensure that when we do and can expand uh, that uh, the facility won't be uh, inhibiting that growth. So when the construction is completed, uh, this is what the terminal will uh, eventually look like. Uh, it was a pre-existing terminal. It dates back to uh, World War II days. The, uh, many of the tanks are crude tanks. It used to be a crude uh, facility uh, to feed crude into our Sweeney refinery. Uh, it also exports products uh, such as you know, some naphtha, avgas, and other uh, clean products. So we're adding in the LPG infrastructure for the exports. We have uh, two ship docks uh, that will both be uh, suited to load VLGCs all the way down to uh, handies. And uh, <clears throat> each dock will have two loading arms apiece. Each loading arm can do about 12,500 barrels an hour, so we'll have a, a load rate of 25,000 barrels per hour at each dock. Uh, we can load two ships simultaneously. If we do, uh, our max capacity will be 36,000 barrels an hour. <clears throat> We're also building, you know, what's going to facilitate this 25,000 barrel an hour load rate is we are building a 550,000 barrel fully refrigerated propane tank, which is uh, this tank here. So having that fully refrigerated tank on site uh, gives us a much better load rate over the competition uh, that we're up against. We're also building, uh, we'll have C5 cap uh, capability at this export terminal as well. We have three brand new C5 tanks that are being constructed at this time. Okay, so you've seen uh, you know, some of the shale uh, presentations earlier. This just kind of outlines uh, what you've seen uh, for the uh, annual ending stocks, you know, the growth in stocks, and the growth in production. You know, as uh, Bob mentioned, uh, you know, obviously, you know, times are changing, and we may, you know, see some curtailing in, in these uh, growth numbers going forward. But this is just to show just how much, uh, you know, the landscape has changed in the U.S. over the years. These are the primary uh, basins, you know. Uh, as Bob also covered, you know, Bach and Eagle Ford, Marcellus, Utica, Permian are really the, the majors, and you have uh, several other smaller ones uh, that uh, produce uh, barrels as well. <clears throat> so when we talk about the U.S. supply demand, uh, Bob covered, you know, we're, we're kind of flattening out on demand here in the U.S. So uh, the majority of what's coming online uh, in terms of supply you know, is going now for export, and you've seen dramatic growth in the uh, amount of export capacity, and it's continuing to grow. So back in 2012, only about 15% uh, of the product was export. Uh, by 2020, we estimate about 40% of that product will, will be exported. Well, when we look at the, uh, the terminals that are out there, uh, for the East Coast terminals, uh, you have uh, Sun Logistics uh, up in Marcus Hook and DCP in Chesapeake. DCP is only uh, butane. Uh, Sunoco does the, uh, C3 and C4, and they will also have ethane eventually. Uh, Kinder Morgan had a proposed terminal at Farrell's Hills. Uh, you know, they still advertise that from time to time, but we're not really sure that it's going to be uh, opened, and uh, it's, it's really logistically constrained. Uh, to really make a lot of sense, but they've also been advertised to be looking at the Gulf Coast for some uh, potential export capacity, so uh, they bear watching. Obviously, Kinder Morgan's a major player in the uh, midstream uh, arena. <clears throat> when we look at the uh, West Coast, uh, West Coast obviously is a very, very tough environment to try to do anything uh, in oil, period, uh, and it goes the same for LPGs. The only uh, operating facility that was already uh, present was the Petrograss uh, Ferndale facility. They do some exports. Uh, they've just recently started uh, butane, or uh, sorry, propane. Uh, they were primarily a butane export facility. So uh, there have been a couple of other facilities uh, proposed. Uh, Sage Midstream had a uh, terminal they were looking at. However, that's been pretty well blocked by environmental and other issues. Uh, Pembina has been is 
still alive, but kind of on life support at the moment. Uh, not really expecting that uh, that's going to uh, be a viable uh, project either. And of course, the the big mover of uh, exports is the Gulf Coast. You know, basically Texas. So you've got uh, five facilities here in Texas. Uh, obviously, Enterprise is is the largest and growing. Uh, they have a, a major expansion coming, and uh, you know it's still slated for the end of this year, we believe. But uh, you know, we hear rumors that it could slip into 16 as well. Uh, Oxy, uh, as Bob mentioned. You know, has started up operations. They only do an HD5. Uh, they do not have export grade uh, capability at that terminal. So they have a very limited uh, uh, demand audience for, uh, for that product. Uh, there's also been a lot of rumors as to just how uh, long that project may stay viable. Uh, their, uh, their new CEO seems more upstream focused and uh, you know they were originally gonna put in export grade uh, capability, uh, but we're hearing now that they uh, may back away from that. So. Uh, of course, you know, the one we like to advertise is our facility uh, down in Freeport. So based on the supply, uh, you know, obviously for the exports, uh, how do you get it there? So uh, shipping is uh, about your only method to get to the primary demand centers being uh, Europe and uh, Asia. So VLGCs are the are the primary long haul mechanism. Uh, there's a large, large number of new VLGCs entering the market over the next uh, year and a half now. Uh, we're in the heavy part of the delivery period here, and we'll see uh, <clears throat> you know even more ships in 2016. So this uh, this is obviously going to put a lot of pressure on the freight markets. Freight has been a major piece of the uh, ARB equation here. Uh, it's really inhibited a lot of ARB movements on a trading basis. Most of the barrels you've seen moving are moving uh, because they have to and uh, because they're uh, contracted. So another piece to this is the Panama Canal expansion. So when you look at the uh, expansion, uh, obviously you've seen a lot of bad press here recently. Uh, you know, the, the new lane in uh, Panama which would allow the majority of the VLGCs to transit. Uh, there's only four VLGCs in the world currently that can transit the canal as it is. So this lane's important for the, for the VLGC traffic to be able to uh, eventually transit through. However, there, uh, there is a significant crack in the uh, new lane uh, in the concrete, and there's uh, a lot of questions as to just when uh, that new lane might uh, be open. You know, the Canal Authority still says it's on time, but they also haven't presented what the repair plan is going to be uh, for that. Okay, when, uh, when we talk about pull, uh, it's obviously the demand side of the equation. So, uh, the one one of the primary destinations for this product is uh, Europe. Obviously, uh, you know Europe is mostly a petchem heavy uh, demand sector, so. You're always in competition with naphtha uh, for uh, the amount of supply going there uh, and you know uh, when you look at the east coast facilities you know they're better suited uh, both in size and scope to uh, really fill this demand so there is going to be a need for some of the gulf coast supply but uh, i think the majority of this will really come out of the east coast of the u.s the other uh and the, you know, the much larger demand area is obviously Asia. And as we've uh, heard uh, earlier today, you know, there's a lot of competition in Asia for you know, molecules going there. You know, you've got LNG, you've got you know, every other uh, molecule that can possibly go there you know, is fighting for space and, uh, and for acceptance. So when you, uh, <clears throat> when you look at the uh, big demand side on uh, LPG, uh, Japan and Korea have really been the, the primary, uh, the largest importers for a number of years. China has now obviously made great strides and uh, I believe they're now second overall and uh, you know could take first here very soon. Japan and Korea have really kind of flattened out on their demand side and uh, you know uh, speaking with them uh, we see just limited opportunities for them to grow uh, in the next five to ten years. So. 
That's it. Okay, we're going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about pet cams. I think most of you know that uh, within the next uh, three to five years, we're spending anywhere from 100 to $150 billion on the U.S. Gulf Coast predominantly for uh, petrochemicals and taking advantage of the shell gas. And so uh, that is not without risk, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the risks some of these guys are taking. It takes a lot of guts to make these kind of investments. And so I want to talk a little about this revolution. All this, all this uh, renaissance of new uh, cheap ethane has created a feeding frenzy in the area of creating ethylene crackers and building ethylene crackers to make uh, ethylene derivatives to ship around the world. So let's talk about the top 10 scary things about building a $5 billion ethylene polyethylene complex on the Gulf Coast. Number 10, these are 30-year investments. So disruptive technology can really play a part in this, whether it's coal to olefins technology or ethylene uh, catalyst technology, or if it's non-related technologies like battery technology that can crash the price of crude oil, which makes us uncompetitive with the world and ethylene in that respect. Declining labor force, everybody's talking about the baby boomers retiring and all that kind of, kind of business. Tariffs, uh, we're not going to be able to penetrate these export markets very easily. There's going to be protectionism. There's going to be tariffs in polyethylene. Again, that's another, another thing that these guys are worried about. Number seven is government subsidies for ethylene, polyethylene production. Everybody, everybody's talking about Asia as the big import uh, uh, sink for the world, and it's so true for polyethylene also and all the ethylene derivatives. Where's all this stuff heading? Guys, it's heading to Asia. And they're already subsidizing this. They're subsidizing this by building coal to olefins units. Coal to olefins units are the most expensive plants to build, but their variable cost is very low. So the Chinese, they don't care about the capital cost. They care about employed people, and they care about the variable cost, which is the long-term cash flow. So on a return on investment, they're already subsidizing ethylene and polyethylene production in China with their coal to olefin strategy. New ethylene complex uh, construction overruns. Well, uh, I've been in this industry for about 25, 30 years, and we used to build an ethylene cracker for 50 cents an annual pound. Most of these crackers, ethane-based crackers today, are built for a dollar to a dollar 20 an annual pound. So they're already cost overruns built in to the fact that the engineering costs and the labor costs are so much higher than the last time that we built an ethylene cracker, which was 2000. Declining U.S. natural gas demand growth. Okay, that can either be from true demand growth or it can be through carbon, carbon footprint regulations. But we have to have demand growth also to produce the hydrocarbon consumption to drive the ethane or to produce the ethane into the, into the market. Overbuilding U.S. ethane-based capacity. Guys, we have a feeding frenzy going on here. I mean, it is crazy. And everybody's building ethane crackers with no flexibility. We have all kinds of other feedstocks we could use. But a flexible cracker cost, can cost as much as twice as much to build as an ethane cracker. So everybody's building the cheap, you know, uh, ethane crackers. And so my concern is that we're going to uh, actually uh, build ourselves out of, uh, of a decent, low-cost uh, supply of ethane. Number three is non-based ethane exports, non-market-based non ethane exports. And what I'm talking about there is uh, if you're doing an ethane deal for an export terminal like out of Mark West and you're, you're buying it at a BTU basis, okay, that's locking in a competitive advantage to the market. We have the only true market for ethane in the world. So our, mar our ethane price fluctuates with supply and demand. And everywhere else in the world, it's typically controlled by government entities which are based on a, you know, a cost plus or a BTU plus basis. And so if we start exporting a lot of our ethane, either as ethane or I think even more uh, 
uh, another uh, even more uh, critical is we start exporting ethane in the natural gas. So we start exporting hot gas, 1400 BTU gas. So now we're exporting all the ethane as part of the natural gas ship that's going out. Then, you know, we're going to create demand that's going to that's going to be very uh, difficult to deal with for these U.S. based ethane crackers. Number two may be surprising to some, but the number two reason, the number two scary thing is decline in crude oil, I mean the shell oil place and shell oil production. And I'll show you why that's so important as we get into it. And the number one scary thing, if you're spending $5 billion on an ethane cracker in the United States, is what happened in 2001 and 2002 when you had, 10, you had $6 BTU natural gas and $35 crude and we shut down 8 billion pounds of ethylene capacity during this time. So that's the number one scariest thing. I don't want anybody that's thinking, I mean, $35 crude, I think more people would think there's a chance for $35 crude than there is for $6 natural gas. But if we do, if we do all kinds of carbon footprint regulations and, and put all kinds of cost on it, uh, maybe a carbon tax, you could get to $6 on your natural gas, we could be right back where we were in 2002. Again, these are 30-year investments. Okay, you're building this thing for the long haul, and these are the kind of things that we're really worried about. So let's dig into this a little bit. This is the ethylene, this is the uh, supply and demand for ethylene going forward. And you can see it's been very flat for a long time because it takes about four, five, six years to build an ethylene cracker. Well, all this is going to hit 2016, 17. And you can see between 2016 and 17 to 2022, we're looking at something like a 10% annual growth rate in ethylene capacity during this period. Now, this is if everything that's announced is built. I don't personally think that everything that's been announced is going to be built, but this is what that would look like. So where is all this ethylene going? Well, ethylene has no end uses itself. It has to be turned into a derivative, correct? So it's either going to go, it's got to go somewhere. So where is it going to go? Well, this chart here is a little bit complex, but let's spend a little bit of time on it. The blue line is the ethylene expand, uh, capacities. And you can see how it's rapidly increasing in about 2016, 2017. The red line is domestic demand for ethylene derivatives. And since 2010 through 2014, that demand has been growing at about a 1% rate. So you can see if we continue at a 1% rate, there's no way that we can consume this ethylene domestically. Even if we bring manufacturing back to the United States, which a lot of people are talking about, and I'm a big cap, uh, champion of, I'm trying to get these polyethylene guys to capture market share back, let's start making refrigerators and things like that back here again and repatriate a lot of that, we might be able to get up to 2.5% growth rate. Okay? So what's going to be the answer? Well, this is the ethylene, our ethylene demand, okay, with exports. And you can see that our exports are going to have to grow at a very rapid rate. And our goal is to maintain a capacity utilization of around 90%. Okay? To maintain that, you know, we're going to have to maintain a competitive advantage. Correct? So let's look at what that looks like. This is what we're faced with right now. And this only goes out through 2022, and most of these crackers and, and most of this derivative, I think, will be built. So we're going from exporting somewhere around 10 billion pounds of ethylene derivative or ethylene equivalents. This is ethylene equivalent. So you take the ethylene content of the derivative and back it into total ethylene exports. You can see that, that we're going to be exporting something like 20 billion pounds of ethylene equivalents by the time we get all these crackers built. And most of that's going to be in the area of polyethylene. There's going to be some glycol, PVC, but the majority of it is polyethylene. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on that polyethylene value chain and margin chain that's going to permit this. The only way, guys, that we're going to export this much polyethylene is to maintain a significant competitive advantage from a feedstock cost standpoint. And again, we're building ethane crackers. So if ethane's not there, if ethane extraction margin spike, we're going to start shutting down ethane units. So I've been doing a lot of work on this area because I'm really concerned with the ethane supply, especially with what's going on with shale oil production. So let's take a little bit closer look at what it's going to take to provide the cheap feedstock to drive this big engine that's being built right now. 
So, you know, ethane production, it's a, it's a byproduct. In fact, I call it a waste product. I ran an oil company for three years, and I tell you, and we've added thousands of projects, okay, prospects to drill. I never put a price of ethane in my economics, ever. Doesn't happen. It's a byproduct, okay? So you don't, so, so it's not going to drive investment in oil and gas. Ethane price is not going to drive it. So it's got to be natural gas demand or, or LPG demand in general. So here's natural gas demand growth going back uh, to 2001. But let's focus a little bit more closely on the environment with cheap natural gas, which is what we have now, and everybody's talking about it. We're probably going to maintain very cheap natural gas. If we look at from 2010 through 2000 to current, we've been averaging about a 3.2% annual growth rate in natural gas to mangrove. Now, I'm not talking about export capacities or, or production capacity or anything because we have to have demand. And even though I know we're building 10 BCF of export capability and it's going to be a big bump in 2017 and all that, we're still going to have to have the demand. And if our natural gas is not competitive because we have $30 crude oil, those, those things are going to sit idle. So it's not going to be demand. So I'm looking at demand growth, and I do think that the price of natural gas is so cheap, like it has been since 2010, especially since 2012, that we're going to be able to maintain this kind of demand growth. But say we don't. Well, worst case is maybe it'll fall off to 2.3. Now, I'm not an expert in natural gas demand growth. The guys in this room are a lot more experts than this. But when I looked at that, even with this, this didn't matter. This really, either one of these demand growth matters, when I changed them and put them into my ethane production model, didn't change it, but by a few percent. It was not the significant issue. This surprised me, because when I went in and started doing this study, I thought it was demand growth that we had to have to produce the ethane. Guys, that's not why we have the glut ethane. We don't have the glut ethane because demand growth has produced increased two and a half, three and a half percent per year. The reason we have surplus ethane is the explosion in wet gas production. Okay, if you look back from 2010 to 2013, the GPM level of our natural gas production was somewhere around 3, 3.2. And GPM is just, I don't know if I think most of you people know about GPM, but it's gallons per thousand cubic feet of natural gas produced. So it's, and it's an NGL bucket, so all the liquids that you're take, taking out and you're sending to the fractionator. And you can see that it's, it's increased rapidly. Again, look when it started, about 2012, 13, 14. This is in perfect conjunction with our offtake ability to get ethane out of those ethane-rich regions, which is the Bakken, the Marcellus, the Permian Basin. We had to build pipelines. We had, we had a glut of ethane back here, but it just wasn't at the market. In fact, I knew back here in 2011 when ethane was 80 cents, I knew it was going to BTU value because I saw what was coming, because I talked to my oil and gas buddies. I didn't think it was going to stay there as long as it is right now, but I knew it was heading that direction. So what happens, okay, we're going to look at a couple of cases. I'm going to look at a low ethane supply case. Okay, low ethane supply case. Also with this shale gas, shale oil production, our ethane content in the NGL barrel has changed from 35% 10 years ago to some areas are producing as high as 60% ethane in that NGL barrel. But I'm saying it's going to, and right now it's about 43%. I'm saying that's going to continue to increase as we increase shell oil and shell gas production. And we're going to get up to a maximum level, about 47% uh, uh, ethane content. But I'm also saying we're going to have sh lower shell oil production. That lower shell oil production is going to cause us to actually see our GPM level decline over the next few years. I think you've heard a lot of people talking about the decline in ethane production and that NGL production because of this. This is also being driven by, and I know you've heard people talk today about drilling that dry gas. There's people in, in, up in the Marcellus region when propane was free, they couldn't sell it for anything, they couldn't get rid of it. They moved over and started dry, drilling dry gas because they couldn't get rid of their NGLs. That could also have a big effect on here. And we, I think, as a lot of people are talking, I think this, this phenomenon that we got, the low crude, the, the decreasing shell oil production and everything, it's probably gonna last through 2017. Until we get that, you know, that uh, we get through all those hedges that people are producing against a hedge and not against their today's price. When those things run out, when all that protection runs out, they're going to have to cut back drilling even more than we have today. 
and I think that's when the oil price is going to kick up, and that's when we're going to go back to drilling, uh, you know, the wet gas and the shell oil plays in 2018 and beyond. I've got two cases, though. No one really can tell me. I know there is levels like in the Bakken, it's 11 GPM, and up in the Marcellus, there's areas that are 6 GPM. No one can tell me what they think the average GPM level is going to go to. I mean, if you continued on this kind of a slope, you could say it getting to 6. But I don't know anybody that, you know, I've talked to a lot of experts in this area, and they don't believe that would be true. It's probably going to flatten out, and it may get up to about 5. This is my low case. Okay, this is low case, and all these are done, these two cases are going to be done with low natural gas consumption, that 2.3% that demand growth over time. Uh, if you look at the high case, again, we're going to, this is oil, oil prices come back sooner. We start getting back into the shell oil plays sooner. Uh, we get a rebound back up to $60, $70 a barrel oil, say, by... Uh, say by sometime in 16. And we also continue to go after those NGL barrels. So now my high end is about 5.5 GPM on average and, about, and the low side is about 4.8. So this is my high case, ethane supply case. And I'm also saying that since we're doing more shell oil production, shell gas production, we're gonna have an ethane content of about 50%. Okay. All right, so let's boil this down into supply and demand. Let's put this with the ethylene demand side of it and look at the whole picture. Do we have enough ethane to run all these crackers that are coming up? Well, let's look at exports first. We've been exporting ethane pretty aggressively since the turn on of the Vantage pipeline out of Hess, out of the Bakken, that started in 2014. We're up to about 70,000 barrels a day of ethane exports by pipeline. So this red area is the ethane exports that's going by pipeline into Canada, going to their ethane crackers up there. Some of it's going to Sarnia, and some of it's going to Alberta and, and Calgary area, okay? So that's that. It's gonna get up to somewhere, you know, somewhere in the end about 150,000 barrels a day. This blue is the total exports by ship. This includes both the Mark West stuff that's going out in the Northeast and also the Enterprise Project out of, the, out of the Gulf Coast, out of the Houston Ship Channel. Total capability, and again, this is capacity to export. I'm not saying the demand's gonna be there, but I'm gonna plan for the demand to be there. I'm gonna say these are take or pay contracts, and they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, and they're gonna take it. Now, the good thing is that a lot of this export here is based on the Mont Bellevue ethane price. That's a good thing for us because in actuality it costs 20, 25 cents a gallon to export it, all in cost, including the capital. On a variable cost basis, of course, it's much, much less, and there's people in this room that are much better experts in that than I am, so I'm not gonna, gonna guess on that, but I think there's gonna be issues with running these export terminals flat out, if ethane, especially if ethane gets tight. So that's, that's a demand case, and again, 400,000 barrels a day, guys, is like, Four, four world scale ethylene crackers. And guess what? It takes six years to build an ethylene cracker. When did an enterprise announce that export terminal? They announced it, they probably would start working on it in 2015. You know, within a couple of years, all of a sudden we built four ethylene crackers, effective on the demand side. So let's put it all together in one big picture. This is gonna be the low ethane supply case. Okay, 47% ethane content. One thing I want you to notice is the left axis has changed. It was in GPM before. Now I've converted it into thousands of barrels a day of ethane. And it's kind of interesting. Look at the shape of this curve. This is one of the first killers I had that natural gas demand is not what drove ethane, this huge surplus of ethane. It was the GPM, because this is the same shape as we saw with the increase in GPM level in our, in our natural gas. So this is the low case. The dark green line here, and sorry if you're colorblind, I'm sorry I made these lines. My brother couldn't see the difference in those lines, unfortunately. Sorry about that. But this is just the, ethane, just the ethylene crackers demand here, the bottom. If you add the exports on top of it, you can see that it's a significant increase in demand. If we're on the low case, okay, as I showed before, 
when we bring these crackers on in 2018, guys, we're going to be out of ethane. See this balance here in 2011? They're right on top of each other. What were the extraction margins for ethane in 2011? Anybody know? 50 cents. You know, that's when Enterprise locked in that ATEX, those ATEX contracts, you know. Um, so we could get in a situation here where it's going to price itself up to the next feedstock. It went to 50 cents because crude oil was 100 bucks and the next baitable feedstock was, was very high. So that's why it could go so high. You'll see in my forecast it can't go to 50 cent extraction margin because it'll kill demand because it'll go to other competing uh, feedstocks for that, for, that can be used in an ethylene cracker. So this is the low case, okay? We're going to be out of ethane, low case, okay? If we do all the exports and we do all this, I just don't see. There's, we can do the first wave of crackers, but this second wave of crackers, oh, and this crackers on this list is my list. This is my list of the ones that I feel or have a 80 to 90 percent probability. That other list I showed you was just everybody that's announced. So you'll see this is at a lower level of ethane demand than I had on the previous slide. I mean, on the uh, uh, on the uh, previous slide. So this is where we're heading with our crackers. This is where we're heading with exports. And there's going to be a train wreck right here. And you just don't have enough. Let's look at the high case. So the high case again, 50% ethane content. We're we got good oil prices. I'd say 60 to 80 dollar oil prices. We're drilling oil. The the shell oil is getting back to you know maybe a thousand rigs running. We're going to be producing a lot of ethane. Okay. So now if you look at the same curve, we got we need to build more crackers. And until we get out in here, we've got we got let's build another one. Let's build let's build five or ten more because we need the jobs. So, so that's the kind of the story here is right now, I can't tell you if we're going to have enough ethane to run these crackers or not. It depends on, and unbelievably to me, it depends on the price of crude oil. And it's a double whammy. When crude oil prices are low, 70% of the world's ethylene production is made from crude oil type products, mainly naphtha. So when it's low, guess what? Their cash cost to make ethylene is not 50 cents, it's 25. It was 50 cents in 2014, it's 25 today. So all of a sudden that, that margin that we had is boom. Our cost right now is about 10, 12 cents. Now it's gonna drive our ethane. So now if we don't drill the oil, cause it's too low a price, now it's gonna cause our ethane prices to go and it's the perfect storm to kill these ethane crackers. So then their margins get to nothing. But I'm going to show you some slides that show that even with, say, $45, $50 crude, and even the low case, we should still have a competitive advantage, but the return on the investment for these crackers is not going to be what they expected at all. Let's go back in time. Worst case scenario. Between 2008 and 2009, we averaged three GPM. Natural, that, was the, that was the NGL content of natural gas, three GPM. If, if, our, if, if we were at three GPM today, guys, we'd have 1,200 barrels a day, 1.2 million barrels a day of ethane supply, not 1.7. That's how significant that GPM is. If we get in a situation where we actually quit drilling the wet stuff, and our GPM starts going back down, I don't even want to leave those numbers because we're not going to have enough ethane. We're going to shut down the old crackers. We got a whole lot of, quite a few old small crackers that are two or three cents higher cash cost to run than these big new ones, maybe even four. They'll have to shut down. So it's a scary scenario. Ethane is what we live on and it's a co-product to this industry, to the oil and gas industry. So let's look at a few forecasts. How am I doing on time? Uh, running short. Okay. Okay. So this is my forecast. Let me just go run through some of this stuff real quick. Let's just talk about margins. Back here, Asian crackers were favored back here. We sh in this time frame, we shut down 8 billion pounds of ethylene capacity because crude oil price was $25 and natural gas here was 8. That was Asian crackers. And the, 
going forward, we're favored. So you can see this is the, this is the margin, the polyethylene chain margin that matters. Okay? You need about 25 cents chain margin through the cycle, you know, average of the cycle to give you about 20% internal rate of return. So in this case, with low ethane supply, you know, this is kind of the scenario we're looking at. The ethane extraction margin is going to take margin right away from, from the ethane guy, ethylene guy. So that whatever that ethane extraction margin goes to, you divide that by two, and that's what the cash cost or cash margin differential to the ethylene guy is. So you can see that we're still advantaged, though. We can still export. As long as the red line is above the blue line, guys, we still have a competitive advantage. This is with uh, high ethane supply. You can see I've got extraction margins much lower, and it's going right to the pocket of the polyethylene guy directly. This is the low crude case. Low crude case, no one's happy. Okay, no one's making any money because we're bringing all this capacity. We're still slightly advantaged, and that's at a crude price, average crude price of somewhere around 50 bucks long term, and a natural gas price around four, 450. So there's still some advantage there, and we can run our uh, run our plants, and we can get them into that market. If it's high ethane supply, then we got even more margin. Okay, so you remember what the number one scariest thing for a guy building a $5 billion complex is, is $6 natural gas and $35 crude. That's what that looks like. That looks like the good old days of the 90s when we, in the, around uh, 2000 when we shut down 8 billion pounds of ethylene. Now they're going to have the advantage. They're going to be the price setter. We're going to be the price taker, and we're going to be shutting down ethylene capacity. So. That's it. There's some, a lot of concerns around the ethane supply. I hope the crude oil price goes back up so we can drill this shell oil and get the ethane we need to run $100 billion of assets that we're building today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to uh, open the floor to questions at this point. Well, I personally think they're not going to. Okay, that's my personal view. I showed worst case that this is the capacity to export. It's not necessarily what's going to be exported. I think there's a lot of hurdles for them to pass, especially the stuff going out of the Gulf Coast, because all the stuff going to the Enterprise Export Terminal is going to be a, a Bellevue, a Bellevue price. So it's going to be Bellevue Plus. They're going to be buying ethane at Bellevue Plus, and cracking it. And, I mean, and, and putting it into ethylene units. Now, this ethane, though, you need to understand this ethane is going to crackers that if they don't get this ethane, they shut down. This is not, this is not supporting new ethylene expansions in, in other parts of the world. Enios is taking it themselves because their loot, the ethane that's coming out of North Field is, North Sea Field is drying up. So they had to do it or shut down that Grangemont cra ethylene cracker, two of them there. Same thing in India with Reliance and Borealis, the same thing. They have ethane-based crackers that their ethane source is gone. And so from that standpoint, I think it has a, a little bit higher probability of running, even if the economics don't look very well. Now, if, if that's why I said it's probably going to go on a variable cost basis 
okay, especially to uh, like to Reliance or to Borealis or someone like that because it's a sunk cost. Once they bought the ships, and they are buying the ships, I mean, you listen to it, they're building their own ships. They're not gonna be relying on, on ship brokers or ship builders. They're, they're, we're putting the capital in to make sure that they have that pipeline available and they can control it. So do I think we're gonna export 400,000 barrels a day of ethane? Tell me what the Mont Bellevue price is and I'll tell you what I think. But I, I don't think we're gonna run it at full capacity. And, and Enterprise doesn't care because they got take or pay and they're getting paid anyway.
the impact of carbon regulation or, uh, or the speed with which renewables are entering the market. What, what disruptive technologies do you think uh, could, could be out there that people just don't have their eye on at this point? Well, one of the things that, uh, well, I'm looking at battery technology right now. I'm watching it like a hawk. I don't know if you guys know, but there's probably 40, maybe $50 billion a year right now being spent on battery technology research. I mean, all the way from uh, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and uh, Branson to, uh, to BASF has a huge battery group that's working on this. They break this code, guys. It's going to change the world. You can imagine having a car battery that can go 500 miles and can be recharged in 30 seconds. That's their goal, you know? And if they do that, then it's gonna change a lot of things. It's gonna change power grids. You don't need power grids anymore. You're gonna have, and they can cycle 7,500 times is what their goal is. So it'll last like 10 years or something like that. So if they reach those goals, it's gonna change a lot of things. Now I still think, you know, that we're still probably 10 years away from that, but these are 30 year investments on these ethylene crackers. The other thing is photovoltaics. Photovoltaics is actually a positive for us in the, in the petrochemical world. Because right now, one of the things that are holding back developing countries is power. They don't have power. They don't, especially like in Africa and places in India, they can't, they can't afford to run a grid or they don't have the organization to run a big power grid. We are spoiled here in the United States. I buy my power at my house at like eight cents a kilowatt hour. You know, it's unbelievable how cheap it is. And if we get solar power down, what it's gonna allow, it's gonna allow these developing countries to develop faster. Okay, the number one driver in polyethylene demand, now I'm talking about polyethylene demand, which is the biggest ethylene demand, is not cars and durable goods. It's building a, a, a grocery store. It's building a McDonald's. It's building a Walmart. Because polyethylene is, is 75% of polyethylene goes in a non, into a disposable application, non-durable use for packaging. As these worlds develop, you're, the pound per capita consumption of polymer per capita is going to go like this. So actually, in the invent of solar energy are getting these de developing countries to develop faster and get their consumer consumption up is actually going to create huge demand growth in, in ethylene. And ethylene derivative demand growth globally now is somewhere between uh, 3 and 4% a year is our global demand growth uh, as a whole which is slightly above GDP, uh, global GDP forecast, and that's because we got substitution. They're not growing their vegetables anymore. They're going to Walmart and buying them. When they buy their vegetables at Walmart, they carry them in a bag or they're packaged in a bag, and they're not getting them out of their backyard. That's what this, that's what's gonna drive ethylene demand and polyethylene demand to these high levels in the future. Bill, a, a question for you, you touched on the expansion of the Panama Canal and the effects that could have on, on shipping flows. Um, I guess the last data I saw was a projection of April 2016 for completion, although as you noted, that may be in question now. Um, if you would expand a little bit more on how that will change some of the logistics, and, and also, um, are there suppliers elsewhere in the world besides the U.S who are competitors for, uh, for NGL supply, who could benefit from that? Uh, actually, you know, uh, so first of all, the, the canal itself, you know, yes, it's projected for uh, April 16th completion. Uh, as you said, you know, you know, there's been a lot of recent articles about the, uh, the problems they're having on the construction. Um, you know, vast number of people believe that that date will slip. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, Currently, there are only four VLGCs in the world that can transit the Panama Canal uh, through the old uh, lanes. So the, the, the big importance for this new lane was, you know, it would open up the canal for every VLGC in the world to be able to transit. So what this does is it, it uh, obviously uh, changes up trade flows quite a bit. You know, right now the ships have to go from the Gulf Coast of the U.S. around uh, Africa and out to Asia. It's about a 42 transit to get out there. Uh, when the canal opens, uh, you're going to drop that to about 27 days. So obviously, uh, your, your freight costs, uh, you know, the number of ships you need to cover, uh, the Asian requirements goes down. Uh, as I mentioned, we have more ships coming into the market, a uh, vast number of ships. It's over 50
Mark, your number one scariest thought was six dollar gas and thirty five dollar crude. Uh, you know, not to uh, take away the proprietary advice you give your clients, but you know, what what do you put the odds at for for that scenario? Well, in today's scenario, with today's legislation and everything and regs in place, uh, thirty five dollar crude could be a reality as you know uh, as things develop. You know, as we oversupply, even though from what I heard today, uh, I am not a pro I'm a proponent of uh, of the what do you call it the vacuum hitting about 20. You saw my forecast 2018 19. I think we're going back to 80 dollar crude or 70 dollar crude in that time because we're going to over we're we're going to over adjust to the low price. We always do. Okay, we cut capex too much and then it goes up. And then we put too much cap in and it goes way back too low. And if you notice my forecast, I got to go into forty dollars after it goes to eighty because we're going to overspend again. So what I tell my clients is that, you know, that that we I'm most concerned about 
the shale oil production, so I'm most concerned about crude oil. I'm not too concerned about six dollar natural gas because that that's almost double what you know uh, what we I mean not double, but it's probably sixty or seventy percent above the price we need to actually have adequate supply. Because at four fifty, you can see even when we hit four fifty, the gas just came right, and we went right back down at two fifty because again. We made money and we overproduced and we started, you know, drilling 12 wells from one well pad, you know, and, and in the Haynesville when that happened. And and they gave them an opportunity to lock in that higher forward curve and keep drilling, you know. And that's another thing that's going to happen if we get another spike to 80. Is you get, I guarantee these oil guys are going to lock in a hedge on that as far as they can get it to keep drilling if, it, if we do hit 80. So, but to answer your question, I, I, I just uh, say, my advice has always been be flexible and have optionality. And, and against my recommendations to several of my clients are building ethane crackers. I did not recommend building an ethane cracker. I said, you're crazy to put all your eggs in one basket. Build an EP cracker or build an APB cracker to, so you can get the heck off ethane if it goes too high and it'll give us a buffer to survive an ethane shortage. Without any knobs to turn, guys, we're gonna be shutting down crackers. We're not gonna be changing them to a different feedstock. And so, but they don't like the higher capex. So they didn't, they build nothing crackers. So it doesn't matter what I think, cause I'm just a consultant, right? So. All right, on that note, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one, one more question. That's a great question. And it's a fraction of what it used to be. For example, Shell. Shell was losing a million dollars a day, okay, in 2008, when crude oil was 140 and, and they were making ethylene from naphtha and gas oil and they lose a million dollars a day. <coughs> Their manager said, fix it or we're shutting all this stuff down. They didn't, couldn't get the CapEx to fix it and maintain their flexibility. So they just went to ethane and screwed the rest of the stuff. And so they lost their flexibility, okay? They're not the only ones that did that. There's several that made changes to their ethylene crackers that, and they can't go back. And so uh, whether it's from a, a feedstock pipeline standpoint that converted a, you know, a propane line to an ethane line or if it's tankage for the NGL, I mean for the, for the naphtha or gas oils. So I would say that I think we only have about 250,000 barrels a day of swing uh, when we used to have 400,000 barrels a day of swing in ethane. So if we get off the ethane, we can only bring it down maybe two, 250. And, and really the real answer is we don't know because we've not had the environment to get off of, totally off of ethane and onto naphtha and, and propane and butane because ethane still, with the exception of a few months here and there, is still the cheapest feedstock. So I can't tell you for sure, but it's a lot less than it used to be. All right, well, thank you all for, uh, for your interest. Um, in this room, uh, just in a couple of minutes, Rick Margolin of Genscape will present Genscape's uh, winter gas outlook. And if you would, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for their presentations. <laughs>